Hi, welcome to Ethereum Mechanics video number four, where we're going to uh, compare all the various wave models, compare and contrast. This is for general audience. I expect everybody to be here. No tardy people, please. A uh, recap from our exploration with those that are familiar with Maxwell's equation. Uh, we have basically shown that we had two good giants that helped us. One was Gauss, one was Kirchhoff, and they helped us pretty much uh, disprove some other of the... Uh, we got rid of the displacement current from this term of Maxwell's equation, and we showed that this term, in, uh, sorry, this, equa this, this part of Maxwell's equation is invalid, uh, and we show a possible uh, replacement, and, and, and these ones in blue are ones that I say, well, yeah, you can use them under limited conditions, and you can just probably still useful, but uh, you're better off just waiting until you get to the new electromagnetism stuff, and we get you some really good models. So let's just start our discussion of waves with water waves. Uh, water waves, you guys, <laughs> get the heck out of here. <laughs> okay, water waves. This is what a water wave looks like. We're talking about simple water waves. We're not talking about real ocean waves, which have a lot more wind dynamics and all kinds of stuff. We're talking about simple water waves that you can do in a wave tank. And what you have is you have a the height of the water wave at any given time is given by an amplitude. Oh, I got that there. And you can calculate the height at any given point along the phase. And this phase is typically 2 pi ft, or whatever way you want to parameterize the phase. Uh, now, well, the interesting thing is at the height here, it's got the maximum kinetic energy. It's based on the mass of the water and the height that it has to fall. And that kinetic energy is, is related by the height squared. There's a couple more variables, but height squared is fine. As the water falls to the point where it gets to mean sea level, you're going to have the maximum kinetic energy. And that's going to be related to the velocity. There's a couple more variables. I'm just going to keep it simple because we have a lot of people that I don't want to turn off with a lot of math. So you have the height, or the energy is related to the height squared at the high point. When it hits mean sea level, the kinetic energy is going to be max, and it's going to be related to the velocity squared. Okay, so if we show the, the kinetic energy part, you can see that these two waves are going to be 90 degrees out of phase, where this one is zero, this one is max, where this one is zero, this one is, is farthest away from the mean sea level yada 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 you can see all the way down so these are in quadrature they're 90 degrees out of phase so if we were to plot this with the velocity and the height and show them side by side and we were able to plot these in what we call in engineering the imaginary the real space and the imaginary space okay again this imaginary space is something interesting it's something we have no definition for, but it gives us lots of interesting, beautiful answers. Um, it's one of those things like fire where we have used it for 20,000 years but had no clue what it was, but we used it quite effectively. And the complex operator is one of those things we're using imaginary space. So what we do is we're going to map these two waves onto imaginary space. You can, you can imagine this. This H is looking down from the top, although it's kind of spun over. It's kind of, it looks kind of like a corkscrew, doesn't it? And this V is like looking from the side. That's also another corkscrew. And if you were to plot these orthogonally to each other, going with time going off in this direction, you would actually get a helix. Okay. And if you look at the amplitude of the energy, the kinetic energy at the top up here and the potential energy at the top up here, if you add them together over time, you're going to get constant energy. In other words, as this water wave propagates, the energy is... Unify and we're not talking about losses right now. We're going to talk about losses in the next video. The uh, propagation over time, the, we're not going to lose any energy because we're not discussing losses at this point. Uh, but the key thing is it's pretty much a uniform energy over time, and it maps beautifully into the complex number, which gives us a helical form. So the key thing is we can map it to a helix, and we get a uniform amplitude over time, assuming minimal losses here. So let's look at all the other waves that we know, or well, not all, but a good portion of the other waves we know of. Water wave is a helix. It's got constant uh, amplitude and amplitude squared over time. And the medium, the medium is the stuff that the wave has to have to go through. In other words, you can't have water waves without water. String waves also map to a helix. They have a constant energy over propagation, and they need the medium of string to propagate over. 
Sound waves, same thing. Helix, constant, and their medium is air. From the radar handbook, the wave, the model that we use for electromagnetic radiation uh, is a complex operator. It's also a helix. It's constant, but we don't talk of mediums because remember, the ether is one of those things that's been a stuck in the closet. It's a, a skeleton in the closet that we do not discuss. Uh, because our models work, why bother discussing it? In the telecommunications textbook, same thing. They use pretty much the same model. Different variables and parameterization because they have a little bit different problem to solve, but still a helical wave model. The LC circuit that we derived in the uh, previous video is also a helix. It, it's constant and its medium is charge. Uh, and a key I forgot to explain in the previous video, the LC circuit is identical in form to these uh, radiation models up here. The reason why it's identical is because the LC circuit is also identical to the dipole, a dipole antenna, which radiates energy. It is an LC circuit. So it follows. It follows that the radiated energy that we radiate into space should be uh, consistent with the thing that actually radiated the energy. Okay, then we look at Maxwell's Oh crap, We're totally different. Maxwell is a cosine wave. Its energy is lumpy over time, and we don't discuss the medium. It, waves just create, these electric and magnetic fields just create themselves without regard to a medium. That's like, okay. All other wave phenomena require a medium, and what we like to is have a model for light. Okay, it's a helix like all the other wave models, and so we should look for a medium. Because right now, we're basically, the, what the modeling technique these guys are doing is taking a little dipole antenna and transmitting at the speed of light to a receiving antenna, and that's how we transfer the energy. It works. We get good answers, so I change it. So we want to come up and identify this medium, the ether we're going to call it, so that we can develop a proper wave model and discuss and, and, and take our understanding of science one step further. Well, let's take a quick look at the Maxwell, uh, just so that yeah, you can see how it plotted out. In Maxwell, you have two in-phase cosine waves, one for the B field and one for the E field. If you plot them in, in, in real and imaginary space, what you have is you have a cosine wave that's stuck 45 degrees between real and imaginary space. So if you're stuck between real and imaginary space, you're kind of like in the twilight zone. The energy over time is lumpy, and this is ironic because we use a dipole antenna, which is an LC circuit, which has good uniformity over time, and that radiates a lumpy field of radiation. That doesn't make any sense to me. You might even say, well, gee, you know, we have the, the, the energy in the dipole is constant, but we're getting two times the amplitude out in points. Okay, well, maybe there's an explanation for that, so I'm not going to go the over unity route here. Um, and so this is, uh, this is not the model that radar engineers use. When they add up the effect of multiple phased array elements, radiating elements in time, they add the real and imaginary components of a wave that looks like this, and they get the right answer. They, the helical wave model gives them the right answer for the far field pattern of phased array antennas. They don't even use this. They don't even mention Maxwell's equation in the radar handbook. I didn't read the whole book, but I did skim enough of it to know that I couldn't find even a reference in, the, in, in, the, in any of the uh, index for it. So what we're going to do um, is now part of the, the, the thing about understanding the way w waves work. Waves work by transmitting kinetic energy to potential energy back to kinetic energy and that constant transfer between kinetic and potential energy is wave action. Okay, in, in our electric field models, okay, the electric field stores potential energy and the magnetic field stores kinetic energy. And that interplay between the two, which works wonderfully in an LC circuit which matches our electromagnetic ray model, means that we must have the same exchange between kinetic and potential energy in the transmitted wave. So what we need to do is learn some properties of the ether um, by understanding that it's got to work that way in space, or at least theorizing that it must work that way in space as well. Okay, and so I'm going to bring up the ninth rule of acquisition, where nothing is perfect. 
In other words, if we're exchanging, no exchange of energy is perfectly 100% efficient. No engineer will ever tell you that any circuit they derive is perfectly 100% efficient. Capacitors have loss. Everything has loss. So if we're constantly transferring energy between potential and kinetic and back again, each transfer of energy cannot be 100% efficient. Okay, that would mean that light is a perpetual motion machine. And we're going to cover this in more detail in the next video. We're going to get into loss using Olber's paradox. But I'm going to continue discussing the nothing is perfect. No reaction is perfectly instantaneous. No reaction is perfectly equal. Uh, from that, you can probably figure out who else is in my crosshairs coming up. Uh, but now, we can allow rounding to perfection for practical purposes. For example, power transformers are 99% efficient or better. And we teach engineering students to use 100% to make the math simpler, even though we know it's not perfect, it's close enough. Uh, capacitors have a very minimum, minimal, minimal loss, uh, but we always assume we're going to get the energy out of the capacitor that we put in because it's close enough. Uh, they're good enough to be considered perfect, even though we know they're not perfectly perfect. Okay, so that's my lead into the next video. We're going to discuss loss. Uh, to under Now that we realize that there must be an ether, we can start using the other anomalies and paradoxes to help us uh, uncover properties of the ether. And loss is going to be one of those properties that we're going to discuss in the next video. Again, please uh, donate. Um, my printer's having problems, and uh, it'd be nice to get it fixed. <laughs> Luckily, this set came out good. Thank you very much.